All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. It's good to uh, good to see you here tonight. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that uh, what's that? Let's pray. Yeah. Um, all right, let's pray. Just kidding. All right, now the um, this is the um, <laughs> this is week one of uh, Under God or Over God, and, and it is a series that we have talked a bit, little bit about, um, which basically is built on this, this, the question, are we a nation that is living under God, or are we a nation that is just plain over God? Um, you know, and you've heard me in other environments share with you, you know, my view of, of who we are um, as a people, at least in America. Uh, and this, this, this class actually emerged from some questions that were asked. If you remember back well over a year ago, we did a series called, Is Jesus a, a, a Democrat, Republican, or Independent? And it, it, it created a lot of questions and some other things that were in there. Uh, one of the sessions in particular, we dealt with the question, how do you kill 11 million people? And we tied it back to the Holocaust, and the answer was simple, you lie to them. We looked at that a little bit. And so if there were some other questions that emerged from that, and, um, and so I said then um, we would get back to it. Well, it's taken a year, which is, you know, which is nothing in, in church time. Um, <laughs> but as we kind of move to this time, uh, this, we're, we're going to move into this over the next couple of weeks, and, and I'm going to share with you how it's going to work and what's going to happen. I think you're going to find it to be interesting and challenging. Um, what it will not do is it will not... Um, make you a political animal, okay? Um, it will feed into whatever filter you already have in place. So what I'm going to say to you is going to go through the filter you already have, and you're going to hear it that way, and that's fine. That's, that's nothing wrong with that. Um, and, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a couple minutes. But um, the other thing, as I am convinced, though, I mean, as, as, in looking in this room, uh, we are, and, and hearing you guys talk and hearing how you apply things and stuff like that, um, you know, the culture has shifted. If you remember, it has been a year since we did a series called Cancel Culture and Worship. And so now this coming Sunday, we're going to do what would be the follow-up officially to that series, and it's called Need a Bigger Boat. Uh, we're going to talk about that quote from Jaws. Um, but it's built upon this idea that when the culture takes a bite of the boat, it's kind of like the shark going after Quint when he was eating the orca. It didn't matter. If you've seen Jaws, you know that the punchline on this thing. Once Jaws got on hold of the boat, he was going to keep eating the boat till he ate Quint. Mm -hmm. And he did. It was just a matter of, I'm going to keep eating the boat. Didn't matter how big the boat was, he was going to keep taking a bite till he got to what he wanted. That's the culture. And that's the culture we're called to minister into. And it's not good news or bad news, it just is. Jesus said it would be that way. That shouldn't surprise us, it shouldn't shock us. We just get to live through an era of history that's important, and history does matter, by the way. Uh, history does matter. It is important. It, it becomes something that if, if we don't look at it and we don't learn from it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, we can't impact our lives in the way that we need to do it. I mean, and I deal, with, and we do that every Sunday morning, though. I mean, anytime I'm going back in the Bible and giving you some history or background to a passage, I'm pulling the history into modern day so you can understand the context so we can apply it. So history um, is a big deal. Uh, if you were like I was, I went to college uh, here, or well, one of the places I went was here. I went a number of places. But um, when I went to college, I, I initially had declared my major to be history until it dawned on me that they were going to make me responsible for a lot of dates that I was not going to learn. <laughs> so I felt the call of God to move to a different discipline. And so I went and talked to my counselor. I said, look, I'm going to seminary, and i, I got to get a degree to get there. So what is my quickest road from where I am today, taking all the places that I have been? You know, when I, by this time I'd been to a couple places and had a hodgepodge of stuff in a basket. And he goes, well, Jeff, I think if you major in sociology, you could be out of here in a couple terms. God is calling me to be a sociology major. <laughs> so I, I took all the history and I kind of moved it aside, jumped into sociology. Um, and, and, and that's kind of, but, but for me, that's always been a fascinating piece of, of stuff to learn. I, I don't mind history at all. I like it, actually. Um, I like sociology. I like to figure out how people do what people do. Uh, I think it's helped a little bit in the world of church. And so 
we're going to bring a lot of that into this mix. Okay, so that's what's going to happen over the next few weeks. Uh, you'll love it. You'll hate it. We're going to use the Bible too, I promise. Um, but let me give you, let me start with a story. Um, as always, I got a story for you. Um, there's an atheist sitting in his car at a traffic light. The light turns green, but the car in front of him does not move. Now, this atheist has a problem. He is in a hurry. He wants to go somewhere, but the car in front of him doesn't move. And so he's mad. So he screams like he always do in a car, but the windows are up. No one hears you but yourself. It echoes in there. And he beats your steering wheel one time. And the atheist says, well, okay, I, you know, I'm going to draw back. I, I'm originally from New York. I'm getting ready to honk. And just as he gets ready to honk, he looks at the car in front of him closely, and the car in front of him has a bumper sticker that says, Honk if you love Jesus. <laughs> now the atheist has a problem. Because now the atheist wants to honk to get the car moving, but in honking, he might just be giving testimony, which would cause the person driving the car in front to have a Holy Ghost experience and raise their hands and still not go. What to do if you're an atheist in that situation? Now, the atheist has a number of options at their disposal. They can pump the accelerator, hit the car in front of them, push them through the intersection, and just keep plowing ahead with them. They can back up, try to figure out if there's a way around them. If not, go a whole different direction and just leave that car sitting there. But at the end of the day, the decision has already been made. They're not going to honk because they don't love Jesus. Now, while that's a story, it's also an illustration because the atheist is our culture. See, our culture is sitting at an intersection and needing to move forward. The problem is, if you're a follower of Christ, you're in their way. Because our culture, while it has shifted, and our culture has changed a lot over time, the culture has not flushed itself down the toilet, as so many prophets of doom say. You're in the way. And so the culture has to figure out what to do with you and what to do with me, which is why church is so important. Now, I am convinced that when Jesus spent all the time that he spent with Mary and Martha and Lazarus, he went there because he could go there because it was a safe place. The very first sermon I ever preached uh, when we planted a church back in 1993 um, was out of a book of, uh, well, it was a, <laughs> I can't remember. The very first sermon I preached was about church having to be a soft place. And and if you look around this room, it is. You heard people talking. We shared prayer requests. You hear about how people come in, how they get the opportunity to discover themselves, and they find themselves. Now, does it happen for everybody? No. I mean, somebody always doesn't like something. It's the world of church. Wherever two or three are gathered, there'll be conflict. But um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, they, you know, they, they may not like the way they may not like the way I dress. They may not like you know the way I look. I mean, I you know, I've got people who you know. When, we, when, we, when the churches merged a few years ago, we had a, uh, you know, more than one person that walked out the door after they'd given us two weeks and they decided that you know, they didn't like me and they wanted to tell me about that. They felt it was their, their, their call to dump their truck on me. Um, and so I, I took that with a smile. I, I don't know them well enough really to have an opinion of them, so they don't know me well enough, so it didn't matter. And you just go on with life. Um, but for the most part, you define, if you want to connect, that this is a soft place. It's a place where you have that security of knowing that you're okay no matter who you are. So in this room, I know for a fact that we have people from all walks of life. You have all different kinds of backgrounds. You have all different kinds of political leanings. And you have a lunatic for a pastor. <laughs> and, um, and, and he has this ability at times to just make friends and influence people in ways that sometimes, you know, creates a firestorm around him. And, and this will be one of those times. Um, and that's okay. Um, but it's important because for us, we have to make a decision. 
uh, as to how we're going to live. The, the question certainly impacts us as Americans. Uh, you know, what makes us exceptional, as I've told you so many times, it's our Judeo-Christian roots. We lose those, we cease to be exceptional. But we have the responsibility of being a credible witness uh, of who God is and how He works in the world and how He is the hope for our culture. That means that that atheist that's sitting behind us at the light needs to hear from us how to get through the light successfully. They need to hear from us the direction they need to travel. They need to hear from us what needs to happen next. We have a responsibility. That's why we're here. And because of that, and because of that responsibility, then we have to learn to play the game, if you will, and learn the rules of the culture. Um, and so... Are there trends that are out there that I don't like? Uh, yeah, there's a ton of them, and yes. Uh, are there things out there that are, are going very wonky? Yes. I mean, do, do, do you know people, and I know people who are up to their ears in wonkiness? Oh, without a doubt. <laughs> and what we say on Wednesday evening will be interesting, but what we say on Sunday morning is going to even be more interesting for a lot of people, and that's fine. Um, but for us, my prayer for this particular study has been Romans 15, 13. And so if you have your Bibles, let's go there for a minute. We might as well use the Bible. It is a Bible study of sorts. Romans 15, 13. And if someone wants to find that or read that for us out loud and proud, go ahead. We'll let you. Peace, that you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. I diagram that verse for you, because that verse, in some ways, has been my prayer as we've kind of gotten ready for this particular course, and really for us um, as a people, uh, as a church, as, as followers in a nation, if you will. Uh, and it's simply this, if you go back and look closely at the verse, it talks about a God, a God of hope who dumps into us or fills us with joy and peace. That's us, okay? We are that us. So that we can then overflow and pour hope out into the culture around us. So we will be abounding in hope. So in other words, God, who is the giver of hope, filling us with joy and peace so that it can flow out of us and those around us that get caught in that overflow will discover hope. That's our role. That's our job in a culture that's gone horribly south, that is afraid to honk the horn, but they're not going to go away. That's our job in a world uh, of people who are scared, confused. They are post-pandemic or still in the midst of the pandemic, which is a whole different story. Um, we have watched as things have shifted and changed, uh, and we don't know exactly uh, what to do. But that is who we're supposed to be. And so, there's the verse, there's my very deep spiritual theological diagram of it, um, and, and you can use that for what it's worth. Now, I think, I, I get... <laughs> I get bothered when I hear and I listen to the news when I hear some of the political discourse of the day when somebody doesn't agree with somebody and then they throw the words, uh, they're like the Nazis or they're like Hitler. Uh, that, just, that, just, that just really grates me at a level. Uh, it doesn't matter who says it. Uh, here's why, because if you've read the, and I know all of you have, I don't know why I say that, the thrilling key to the kingdom series, um, <laughs> you realize at some point, uh, you know, just because I love Indiana Jones so much, the Nazis become bad guys in, 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 in the stories. Um, and so there's a little bit on there. And so the new book actually uh, goes back into something um, that, um, that Hitler reportedly had. That's a part of the new book um, that I'm writing right now. And so, I, so I've been up to my ears in Nazis. And, um, <laughs> uh, but but as, we, as, we, as we look at that, I, I, I think that's disingenuous to, to call others that. I think that's a, that's a, I'm going to say this as tactfully as I can, you know, because some, because I know that we're filming this and so it will live. It, 
it, it, it, takes, it takes very little talent and skill when you're on the ropes in a debate to just call somebody a name. You can always tell when someone's on the ropes because they start saying, oh, you're, you're a Nazi. You're like Hitler. I mean, they'll just use the tagline. That takes no brains, no skill, no talent. And what it means is they're beat. They're beat. They just don't know it yet. Um, they're a walking loser, and they've lost. Uh, and, and, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and so, so, so you, you, kinda, you, you, you get to that point where you're just like, oh, my gosh. You know? um, so I, I think that there are some words that probably don't need to be used. And, and Hitler and Nazi, that's pretty extreme. But, but it is true that the church historically struggled to find its ground and find its footing in Nazi Germany. And there certainly were some streams of things that began happening in Nazi Germany or in Germany prior to the Hitler rising to power that are worth looking at because now we're back to history again. You need to know what happened and you need to understand what happened uh, so that you can successfully navigate and recognize it. Um, Nazism did not arise in a vacuum. It arose out of a culture that was more than ready for Nazism to emerge. In other words, the streams of culture were flowing in such a way that allowed Nazism to flourish. The thoughts of the day, uh, the norms of the day, the morals of the day. Everything was flowing in that direction. If it hadn't been, Nazism, Nazism never would have gotten traction. Hitler never would have gotten to power. And to not know that or to say that it didn't happen is just being not willing to see history uh, and, and, and wanting to rewrite history. And, and you just can't do that. And so it's fair then to say that are there parallels between some of the things that may have been happening in Germany prior to the not rise of Hitler and the Nazis, and are there some trends that are happening in America today? And so what I've done since we had that conversation over a year ago, is I went back, and since I was writing the book and, and, and kind of doing some digging anyway into uh, some other relics that Hitler had and lost and that are going to show up in my book, um, it's fiction, by the way. Um, but, um, you know, when we think of Nazi Germany, we immediately think of the Holocaust. We think of the millions of lives that were lost. Um, but we really realize that, that, that those circumstances that allowed the Nazis to do that also were the same circumstances that allowed a population of people to let it happen. See, while it bothers me that there would be people in power that would do it, what is even more bothersome that there was the masses that allowed it to happen, that allowed liberty and freedom to be stripped away, to move things in that direction. Someone said one time that if God is dead, then man becomes an untamed beast. And if you remember, uh, somewhere in the 19th century, the movement started that God was dead. Now, see, I, I don't expect America to, to, to run the course of Nazi Germany, by the way. Um, I, and I, we're not going to gas millions of people. We're not going to do, do that. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what we're talking about here. But what we are talking about is looking at why it is that our liberties are important and why it is knowing what's going on is important and why it is that we have a responsibility um, to make sure we're doing this and a culture that needs to know the truth and needs to find hope. Because if they're not going to find it in us, then all we've done is create a safe place for us to hunker down and die in. See, we're a safe place because we're a safe place because we can go out into the world and speak truth. And so there's a battle for the soul that's going on. I mean, I, I know that, sound, that, sound, that sounds really churchy, you know. There's a battle for the soul that's going on. But here, let me tell you something. I, I'm as serious about that as I ever have been in, 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 my, in my five or ten years of ministry now. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm serious about that 
because there is a battle for the soul. And, and, and let me get personal as I can. There's a battle for the soul of my child going on right now. There's a battle for the soul of your children, your grandchildren, the people that you love. There's a battle for the soul of a nation that's happening right now. And you can say it's not, and you can say it's not a big deal, and you can say, you know, it's not my job. And, and you can say that if you want, because you know what? You're free. But if you say that, you better trust in the fact that there's some people out there that love freedom enough to say, you know what? I'm going to fight for it. And I'm going to battle for it because I value it. Because there is a battle for the soul of our kids. Because how many times have you made the statement? Have you heard the statement? We've even made the statement in this room, even this evening, just, and yes, you know, the world has changed a lot. You know, we're older now. Or years ago I did this, but now I can't do that anymore. I mean, times have changed. You're right. I mean, yes, times have changed. I'm a, I am a child of the 60s. You know, I grew up in the 60s. It was fun. You know, I sit down. Uh, and one of the things I think I told you I have, I have in the office over there is I have all of the toy catalogs from the Sears catalogs from the 1960s when I was a kid. And Caden loves to sit down and look at those things with me and look at how cheap things were. <laughs> Not understanding that that, that that price tag of that being cheap, though, was a fortune. You know, and when I read the price, I go, oh, my gosh, this was cheap then. Uh, not so much. Uh, and, and looking at the toys that were there and things like that. Uh, because again, but those days are gone. There are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, you know, and we could sit here, we could sit here for the next you know, year and dissect the problems of what's wrong and never worry about solutions or what we ought to do. You know, I, I mean, I think the greatest, you know, one of the greatest evils in the world, all of you have right now in your pocket or purse. We're connected. You know, our kids have them. They got to have them. And if you're a parent that doesn't give it to your kid, you're a meanie. Because all of their friends have them. And if they're going to be cool, they got to have them. But you, if you tell them, no, I don't want you on that screen, they think you've lost your mind. Go outside and play. I'm not going to do that. I heard a kid say, not here, somewhere else, when they heard that John Madden died. I mean, want to have any more video games? <laughs> Can we have a whole generation of people who thinks Madden's a video game? They don't know. They don't know that John Madden was a great football coach, the youngest football coach ever to win a Super Bowl until this weekend. Which was fun, by the way. And, and, and guys, all I got to say is next year I will bring some dessert because all we had was meat. <laughs> and finally, late in the night, somebody walked in with one cake and we were, we were like, Whoa. but it was all meat, all meat, nothing green, praise God, no vegetables. It was all meat. Am I not kidding? I, 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 Amen. It, it was all meat. So it's a meat event. I got it. If you're vegan, you can't come. I'm just telling you now. But I will bring dessert because i got to have some sugar. Um, anyway. Um, but for where we are and what we're going to look at, I, I think it's important that we understand our role is just as important as it always has been. It's just as serious as it's always been. Um, we always find ourselves caught somewhere between heaven and being citizens of earth. Right? We always find ourselves there. Um, and we want to do it right. And today, the pressure is on the church and church people to combine Christ with other religions or to combine Christ with other political agendas or to combine Christ with other ideological agendas. And if anything... The experience of the church in Nazi Germany should be a powerful reminder that it really does, and it really does count when you hold on to the things and the teachings of Christ and Christ alone, and you don't combine them with something else. Because the church in Nazi Germany did not do their job 
And when the world starts to shift and when changes start, they always change under a phrase that we've now heard in American culture, and it should scare the bejeebers out of you. The bejeebers is Hebrew. <laughs> because people will start changing the rubric of freedom because it is best for everyone. I made a statement Sunday morning in both worship services about the fact that maybe the best way to decide things isn't by majority. And I had email that week from some good old Baptists that think I have lost my mind and I don't know anything about Baptist polity anymore. And I'm going to stick by what I said. <laughs> I'm going to use an illustration in a couple of weeks that will blow your mind about that. But neither here there. But you know, yes, committees are the worst things that ever happened to church. Majority rule, I don't... I, what well, is the majority of the idiots? That's our culture. I'm going to use the phrase, hear the articulation. <laughs> Never underestimate the power of the dumb masses. You hear me? You got it? Don't go over and misquote me. We get, we, we get, I got to say it on Leah. Did that translate online okay, Mark? Did we get that online okay? Everybody heard that? Everybody got that? Dumb masses. You say it real fast, people start spinning in church on you. Don't want to do that. Don't want to turn into the Holy Ghost experience tonight. It's just, I'm just telling you, don't ever underestimate that power. That's majority rule. And and it's easier just to go along with the majority because, well, that's what everybody's doing. Our kids do it in school. We do it in the places that we work. We do it in the places we go, trends and everything else that goes along. We just go along with it. We don't say anything. We just go along with it. But we forget that our job is this, that we are, have been given an amazing gift by God where he fills us with joy and peace. That's us. That we should be sharing with the U.S. See how I did that? U.S., see how I did that? Um, and pouring out hope into the culture. That's our job. That's our role. And so, how do we do that? Well, you don't wring your hands and wait for the return of Christ. Because the return of Christ could happen like right now. Okay. That would have been awesome. Wow, it's so cool, though. <laughs> so cool, right? <laughs> If I'd, had my little, if I'd had my phone ready, I'd had a trumpet sound go real quick. And then, 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 now, then, see, and then what happens, you ever in a meeting where that happens? See who starts jumping. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Free trip post. They start taking clothes off. I got to get lighter. I got to get lighter. These darn shoes are too heavy. Um, <laughs> but. You and I are called to make a difference in the world. And what I said Sunday does tie into what we're talking about. You are immortal. You are immortal. You have something to do, and you have something to do until God says that you're done. You're here. You have something to do. And one day when you're no longer immortal, you will be an eternal, which is a whole different marvelous thing. But for now, you're immortal. I don't know why. You just are. I don't know what exactly you're supposed to do, but you're supposed to do this. Specifically, I don't know. But you're supposed to do it. And so let me tell me how this is going to work, uh, because we'll, we got a lot of content to cover. And we're not, you know we're not going to get through it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> So tonight is kind of an introduction, and I'm going to give you what I call the first level line. And when I say level line, it, it begs the question, are we living over or under God? Are we above it? Or are we below it? And so what we've been doing, if you're a note taker, is the introduction. <laughs> Jeff just waxing eloquently, not paying attention to his notes, just rambling endlessly and talking about things. And then John Barber gets me started about pre-trib, pre, pre, pre post-trib. So let me give you the first level line that you need to know. Because we're only going to get one in tonight because we've got to get, to, we got to get the rest of them. There's seven of these things. We've got three weeks, two a week. I know. Hold on to your hat. The first one is simply this. Because this is what went wrong in Nazi Germany. 
Okay? That's where all this comes from. When God is separated from government, judgment follows. When God is separated from government, judgment follows. Now, see, that flies in the face of our culture. We don't want God in government, at least according to most. Our Constitution doesn't allow that. No, our Constitution does allow that. Remember, I told you in one of the series, how do you identify a tyrant? We did that back. You have to go back online and listen to that. We went through the checklist. This is how you figure out who a tyrant is. And I took you through, this is how you know if you're dealing with a tyrant or not. Um, and they're the ones that take your freedom. See, what you have to know about history is Hitler did not discourage people from attending church. Hitler was a baptized Catholic. He thought church was important. Now, he, he abandoned his faith along the way. And he was not going to interfere with specific doctrines of church as long as the doctrine that the church was teaching would not interfere with what he was trying to do for the good of the German people. So Hitler, in his rise to power, would encounter opposition from the church, no doubt about it. And history is full of, and, and tells the stories of, Bonhoeffer is one of them that you may be familiar with, uh, of folks who stood against Hitler during these days. But Hitler, in his rise to power, tried to ally himself with the churches of the day and encourage them to practice what he called positive Christianity. You be a positive Christian. And what eventually would happen, and what eventually happened in Nazi Germany is, that as the culture became more and more dependent upon the government, then the government put the churches and the pastors on the payroll. And then eventually Hitler would do the full, full, full 360 on them and turn on them and basically criticize them, um, saying that the, uh, the Protestant pastors were cowering dogs who would just do his bidding for the sake of their miserable salaries. Now, he started with an ally in the church. He ended up with a hatred of the church and really recalling those that were a part of it. See, he was okay with church as long as it didn't try to interfere with government policy. Hitler wanted the freedom to do what was best. His quote, the state needs to scrub clean all Christian convi convictions and values. The church has to be forbidden from interfering with the day-to-day -day matters of what they were doing. And as soon as he was sworn in as chancellor then, he turned on the churches just that quick. And he turned on the churches quick. But even in those early days, he paid tribute to Christianity because it helped promote the soul of the German people. And he promised to respect the rights of the churches. And he's promised that there would be a peaceful balance between church and state. And there was, as long as the church did what he wanted. He also distributed himself a, 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 a propaganda, but he put himself out in a picture where he was actually um, coming out the door of a church to show others that he, had, he went to church. He had religious sympathies. He, 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 he liked the things of the church. Article 24 of the Nazi Party platform demanded liberty for all religious denominations in the state so far as they are not a danger to the moral feelings of the German race. You hear that? He assured them that he would let them do what they wanted to do because he wanted them to be free and he was tolerant as long as it didn't interfere with what was best for the German people. Who defined what was best for the German people? He did. Not the church. Church, of course, pushed back against that. You need to know historically the church did push back against that. There was a number of church leaders that gathered together and they they believed that they left Hitler alone, that he would leave them alone. Hence the title of the series we start on Sunday, You Need a Bigger Boat. I'm going to keep taking a bite of that boat till I get to the piece what I want on that boat. It's not a matter of you, you stay there and I'll stay here. No, no, if I start biting the boat, your boat's not going to be big enough. I'm going to keep eating it and eating it and eating it and eating it. I'm going to keep taking bites out of that boat till I get to... And, case of Captain Quinn. 
while the churches thought he'd leave us alone. Hitler had no intention of leaving them alone. Uh, they were on their way to being marginalized. And so before he destroyed the church, he decided to make peace with it and use it for his own ends. Um, he called a summit on January 25th, 1934, where he met with church leaders. As he met with church leaders, uh, he began his meeting by uh, yelling at them and saying that he had been uh, misunderstood. Peace is all that he wanted, peace between church and state. And he blamed the pastors that were there for obscuring and talking bad about him so that people wouldn't understand him. In his conversation with one of the pastors, he made this statement. It's a quote, you can find yourself to the church. I'll take care of the German people. And the pastor looked back at him and said, I think it's my job and my call to take care of the German people. I can't let you have that position. Hitler was furious that night the pastor's rectory. It was ransacked uh, and incriminating material, as it was called, was taken out. A few days later, a homemade bomb exploded just outside of the home. Uh, the police that came to the scene were there even though no one had called them. And so as the police arrived on the scene, um, the criticism continued. Uh, by the time it was over with, this particular pastor was taken, put themselves in a concentration camp, uh, and that's where he basically spent the rest of his life simply because he was willing to look back at Hitler and say, no, no, it's my job to take care of the people, not yours. Because Hitler wouldn't let anybody stand against him. You get to a point where you make this, you, you, get, you get to a moment where the question is a fair question, well, what would you do? I mean, what would you do if the pressure was on? Do you just play nice and just get along? And, and this, is where, this is where the tension gets a, a little bit tough for pastors. And I, and I hang out with pastors sometimes when I can tolerate it, and most of the time I can't. But, but when I hang out with pastors sometimes, I, I get, you, know, you get those conversations because, you know, I, and I like to lob things across the table sometimes. No. <laughs> and so one of my recent questions in pastoral conversations were, hey, guys, show hands. How many of you guys just knuckled under real quick and just kind of shut down as soon as we needed to, we, we needed to shut down because of the, of, of the coronavirus? Although, there was never a mandate in the state of Florida to shut down. How many of y'all just did that? And the room got really quiet. And so finally someone had the guts and said, well, you did. I said, yeah, I did. I did. That's why I'm asking the question. I did as well. And so we've been talking about that, you know, and we talked about this way we made those decisions. And, of course, our board had talked about that, and we made those decisions. It was a good decision. In hindsight, if it comes up again, I'm not sure we're doing it again. Based on what we know now. But somebody out there took away your freedom to worship and assemble for worship, which is a constitutional freedom. I can't be the only person in America that it bothers how quickly we gave that up. And I can't be the only guy out there saying we can't do that again. And so here we are trying to deal with that. How do you do it? And here's the point. You've got to remember, when you move God from the government, judgment follows. See, I can't be responsible for what everybody else does as a leader, as a pastor. I can only be responsible for what I do as a leader, as a pastor. And what I'm going to do as a leader, as a pastor, I'm going to lead you the best I can to do this and do this well. We want to make good decisions. Now, again, you know, I, I am the big advocate. You make the decisions that you have to make uh, to, to, to have personal, for your personal health and well-being. You know, I, you know, again, I, you know, and I said this to a few people publicly. I'll say it to you. Because it's far enough now down the road, no one's going to get too ticked off about it. But we've had people come in and say, you know, well, you know, are, 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 do you make people be vaxxed? Are they non-vaxxed? And, and I say, no, here at the Church of 434, we love the vaccinated, we love the unvaccinated, and we love the transvaccinated. <laughs> now, the transvaccinated are those that are unvaccinated but identify as vaxxed. <laughs> now... We, we love all of them, and what that simply means is, did that, did that go out? Okay. Um, 
What, and what that simply means is, and hear this with all the love I can muster, I don't give a, I don't give a rat's pimple, whether you are or aren't. I don't care whether you wear a mask or don't wear a mask. You wear a mask around your head, on top of your head, below your head, under your chin, around the nostril, around your ear. You know, I heard Jim Gaffigan talk about masks today. It's pretty funny. He said he wanted to wear a thong on his face and just, <laughs> with, with a sense of mystery. Uh, you know, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's crazy, huh? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. He wanted, he wanted to be tasteful, but I mean, I was, I'm like, I, I don't care. But I do care that you do what you're supposed to do to be healthy. You do your job, I'll do my job. You know, I never thought I'd live through an era where the question I was asked by guests who I did not know coming in the door, are you vaccinated, Pastor? Now, my initial reaction is, ain't hey, none of your bills, Neil. <laughs> and that's what I want to say, but what I did say was, of course I am. <laughs> because my mother goes to church here. I mean, it's one of those things where you just figure out what to do. You figure out how to navigate it, but you do what you have to do. But it doesn't matter. But what matters is how we navigate the culture that we're in in such a way that we can be most effective. Now, we're done. We're five minutes over. I'm so sorry. Uh, get out. We'll pick up two next week. Um, if you like it, great. If you don't, 